dip buyers emerge in the calm after the storm. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romain Boston. And I'm Alex Steele. We couldn't even have follow through selling. No, no, Alex. This is how it works. This you is know how, this. I know, yeah. but every time it's surprising me. Not only no follow through selling, but also a record high in Amazon. Go figure. S&P is up by about <coughs> eight tenths of one percent. Tech most definitely outperforming. We'll get to that uh, in a moment. Amazon, as I mentioned, at a record, record high, up a whopping two percent. <coughs> Something to keep in mind, dollar yen. This always is for Romaine here. I was talking to Vince Signorella of Bloomberg. He used to trade FX. One fifty-five is now the line in the sand for some serious intervention. And that thirty-year bond auction was a total bust. Yields up three basis points only, and yet equities still around the highs of the session. Yeah, let's get right to it here, Alex, because while that cooler than expected producer price report uh, didn't quite sort of ease everyone's nerves here after that hotter than expected consumer inflation number yesterday, you see the price action, Alex. Many buyers out there right now really finding some solace that those two reports put together at least signal some underlying economic strength. That's why you're seeing some dip buying here, because it really could be a good thing as we stand at the precipice of a critical earnings season. George Ball, chairman of Sanders Morris, he told Bloomberg earlier, it's not going to be the Fed rate cuts that really drive this market higher. It's going to be earnings. In fact, moderately higher inflation might actually help some of those companies' margins. All told, earnings for the S&P 500 companies are expected to maybe improve by about 10% in the first quarter. That's according to Deutsche Bank strategists. And earnings upgrades from analysts this year have so far outnumbered downgrades in the first quarter. That's according to Citi. Now, our analysts at Bloomberg Intelligence, they say, well, consensus is still cautious heading into the earnings season as sales gains may be a bit more muted than anticipated. So that really leaves investors keen on what executives will have to say about the longer term outlook. But before we get to all of that, we do have to start with two of the big movers of the day right now. In fact, the biggest drag on the S&P is Morgan Stanley having its worst day since 2020. And Alex, Apple right now, the biggest contributor to gains in the S&P having its best day going back to May of last year. Apparently, some new Macs coming out. With an AI chip yeah. in there, maybe? Like, yeah. could that be the big catalyst we've all been waiting for? So this is the chart. It's just a moving average chart. I say just, but it was pretty ugly. So just so you know, you get the pink line is the 50-day, the green line 100-day, and the yellow line 200-day. It just shows the long-term and short-term, medium-term trend. And this is what you want to pay attention to. So this is the 50-day, and this is the spike that we're seeing today. We haven't seen this move uh, since May of 2023. That's a nice gap higher. Do we hold it? Now, it might be easy to talk about Mac and then in terms of the AI-powered chips, et cetera. But then again, Amazon's also at a record high, and overall tech is outperforming. Tesla's even higher. So, I mean, I have to wonder, is it the product that we're looking at, or is it just maybe we sold off a lot? Let's go ahead and buy some shares to stabilize. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, maybe we can pose that question to the person who broke this story, that story crossing the terminal just a little while ago. Apple aiming to boost sluggish computer sales, preparing to overhaul that entire Mac line with a new family of in-house processors designed to highlight artificial intelligence. Mark Gurman joining us right now with more details on this. And Mark, investors really like this. 4% gain in Apple, something we haven't seen in some time. If I were to guess, it's not necessarily the Macs themselves. Obviously, Macs are a small portion uh, of the overall uh, revenue base for Apple, right, on an annual basis, something around 10%. And I'm not sure that any investor believes that's going to skyrocket to uh, doubling revenue or even, you know, uh, going a third higher. I think it's the focus on AI. I think that investors are seeing that Apple's trying to push artificial intelligence to every nook and cranny it could across the company, not only in the new version of the iPhone operating system, not only some of the new software they're working on, not only into Siri, but into their chips as well. And and so, like I reported earlier today, Apple's working on a new M4 chip. The big focus, an upgraded neural engine, uh, which would allow more cores and computational capabilities related to large language models that would run on Macs themselves. Now, I do think Apple's AI initiative will, uh, you'll see a big presentation in June around that, but I do believe it is a multi-year effort. So while the chips are getting these capabilities this year, Probably on the software and services side, it will take a little bit longer, probably into next year, 2026, to see more AI-ification, if I may, uh, in terms of feature set from Apple. You can totally say AI-ification. I totally dig that. Uh, Bloomberg's Mark Garman, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Really good reporting on that. And I wonder, if Ryan, if you just you say the word AI, yeah. and it helps. It just shows, I think, how desperate investors are 
for Apple to have an AI strategy. And to Mark's <laughs> point, too, then that's the whole point, right? They haven't really articulated that strategy in the way that we've heard from Microsoft and Alphabet and some of the other companies. So here, maybe you got it. Yep, exactly. Well, let's get more insight here with Dan Greenhouse. He's chief economist and strategist over at Solus Alternative Asset Management. Um, Dan, we had a whole nice plan for you on something very different, but we're going to start with big tech. I'm, I prepared for the plan. <laughs> right, all you know, up now. we love ripping up plans. Um, what do you make of the rally that we've seen today in big tech? Like, how much of that was it an oversold thing? Is it a buy the dip mentality? Is it product driven? What do you make of it? I think it's a mixture of everything. Although it's, it is hard to argue that there is an oversold condition in, in big tech. I mean, <laughs> On a relative basis. Other than Apple and Tesla is obviously its own thing. But other than Apple, there hasn't really been very much weakness in those names, and justifiably so because. Uh, fundamentally, the companies are, are operating quite well, and while there's obviously a bit of a risk-off tone to the market, uh, at least yesterday, uh, the, the product cycle is what's been driving, Invi driving NVIDIA. The product cycle is hopefully what's going to be driving uh, Apple and what's been driving Microsoft. It, it's not uh, flows because ultimately they all benefit from the passive flows which have been coming into the market uh, more or less um, Un unabated over the last couple of years. Are you surprised that we're almost near 5% per on the two-year, and yet stocks were doing nothing? They're um, higher? Well, yes and no, because I think ultimately the level of rates right now doesn't really matter. The adjustment period matters. And I think to that point, sh sure, I, I, you know, I was joking with, a, with someone, an investor earlier uh, in our fund that uh, we should be printing up shirts. I survived, uh, again, we should be printing up shirts. I survived the great crash of 2024 because it was obviously a full percent. That's yeah. about all you get these days. Um, do, do I think that five percent? I'll, I'll, we'll do that as soon as we get finished printing up please. our er earthquake shirts. I, as long as I get week. my royalty fee. Um, <laughs> do, do I think that uh, 5% is some deleterious yeah. level for stocks? No. Yeah. Do I think that's true for the 10-year? No. But if you have a rapid adjustment, uh, as you saw yesterday, then it will be a problem in the short term. There's been a lot of discussion, though, that we've kind of in this sort of weird sweet spot, kind of inadvertently, if you will. The idea that the market has shown that resiliency as rates went up, it's shown that resiliency as rates have remained elevated. And unless you believe that rates are going to somehow shoot up to 55 6% here, is there any reason to think, why we can't see more gains in this market. No, because I, it's, it's, I think I said this last time I was on air with you guys, it's almost as if rates don't matter nearly as much as some yeah. people thought they did. Uh, and to be clear, rates matter both what the Federal Reserve does and, and Treasury yields. I don't mean to suggest too flippantly otherwise. Um, but, but I think when you have a tailwind where the economy is doing pretty healthy, I, I think we, we need to stop saying it's surprise to the upside. The economy is doing well, full yes. stop, yeah. even with rates where they are. Uh, and, and earnings growth is doing more or less fine, yeah. even with yields where they are. This idea that somehow uh, 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 if the Fed only cuts two times this year or only cuts one times right. this year, that that's some uh, c catastrophe for the market, I, I don't think that's borne out, especially by the performance in the first quarter. Everyone we've talked to over the last few weeks have basically said that the earnings picture is going to be a lot more important for where this market goes next rather than sure. just what the Fed does. But a big component of that was this idea that we were going to start to see a broadening, a broadening of earnings growth beyond just the big tech and some of the big, uh, more established names, and for that matter, a broadening of what people buy. Has any of that changed over the last couple of weeks or months? It depends how you look at it. Yeah. On the earnings front, no. Hmm. Uh, I, I think most viewers probably know, and I'm sure you guys are aware, earnings at the big tech companies are expected to be up 30 whatever percent, mm -hmm. and everyone else, the 490 whatever, yeah. are going to be down a few percentage points. So on that front, it's a little more challenged. But I think that's too broad of an observation, okay. because when you look at the performance of a number of industries and sectors, for a while it was just semis and home builders you would point to. But I think uh, something I've been harping on for the better part of a year now, and I think it's a little more well understood, is what's been going on in the industrial space. Yeah. Uh, it's not just uh, your traditional industrials, I call it Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. It's the names that are data center adjacent, if you will. They're building out the data center. They're cooling the data center. They're building the roads to the data center. There's something going on there as well. The hotel and leisure stocks and, and those, there's, there's plenty of themes to play yeah. beyond simply AI. And so on that front, while I acknowledge the earning story is a little more challenged, on the performance and the fundamental front, I think there's a lot going on that, that's very interesting, if not more so than the AI story. A lot of potential inflection points. Dan, always great to get your insights. Dan Greenhouse, Chief Economist and Strategist at Solus Alternative Asset Management. As we kick you off to the close here, a conversation coming up about CEO sentiment and how it's finally turning the corner. A conversation up ahead with Paul Knopp, Chair and CEO of KPMG. US. All right, plus you got oil just whipsawed as traders digesting swelling stockpiles plus geopolitical risk. We're going to discuss the outlook. And Moffat Nathanson delivering an upgrade to DoorDash.
We're actually going to talk about what's actually fueling the optimism over there. That's in our top call segment. Stick with us. A lot to cover here on The Close on Bloomberg. indicators over the last few weeks about how CEOs feel about their economy. And KPMG uh, is the latest with this outlook. A couple of things that stood out to me. 87% of U.S. CEOs feel confident in the U.S. economy. 72% are looking to increase uh, headcount this year. And the biggest risks are regulatory, operational issues, cybersecurity, and tax. Super interesting that inflation was not one of those biggest risks. Now, Romain, what I also find interesting here is that the NFIB, the Small Business Survey, shows something very different. Yes. That overall survey is the lowest level since 2020, uh, 2012. They're still looking at a super tight labor market, and they're still worried about inflation, and they're really worried about sales. And I'm wondering kind of where the discrepancy uh, lies. This has been a disparity for a while, and we always kind of joke about the big economy and kind of the real economy, if you would, Main Street economy here, that's a disparity everyone's yeah. trying to sort out. And you can even see yeah. it in inflation, for example, mm -hmm. or spending. Well, joining us for more is uh, Paul Canope. He's chair and CEO of KPMG US. Great to be here. Thank you for uh, joining us. Tell us about the survey and the discrepancy that we see among the guys you survey and the little guys. Well, so I definitely believe that CEOs recognize the challenge with inflation. You know, we see geopolitical risk and cyber risk as being near-term risk. And the near-term risks keep evolving. Four years ago was the pandemic. Three years ago was the Great Resignation. But mm -hmm. two, you know, sticky inflation, a really tight labor market are structural things that we think are going to persist for quite some time. And when I say sticky inflation, what I mean by that is inflation has been reduced quite a bit. But at the same time, it's in that range where it seems to be uh, difficult to believe it's going to get back, back down to 2% anytime soon. So that is a challenge. Now, in the face of all those geopolitical risk and structural changes, we also have a lot of confidence from CEOs, as you noted. And I think a lot of that confidence comes from the fact that the economy, the economy has been very resilient and we've navigated these challenges quite well the last four years. So if both the small and the big guys wind up having tightness in the labor market, how are the clients that you surveyed managing that? Well, certainly, uh, as you think about going forward, you're trying to make your workforce more productive and efficient. One of the things that we found in our study is that generative AI is in the plans of many CEOs to try to ensure that we get to that point. Also, uh, in some cases, CEOs are not going to be requiring college degrees. They're looking at alternative hiring models, their service delivery models. So. When you say, it, though, they're not requiring college degrees, so you're talking about basically lowering the standards. So that seems to suggest they're still having trouble finding. So I, I think we've gotten very comfortable, Romaine, upskilling, reskilling people. Uh -huh. So I don't so much see it as lowering standards, but you know, really good people that can be upskilled, reskilled mm -hmm. to help us get after some of these shortages that are in the market. And again, I think some of these shortages will persist for quite some time. But they are still in that hiring mode. They still need a, a reason, and they see sort of potential to increase headcount. Yes, I mean, of that study, I think it was 32% of CEOs said they would significantly increase hiring in the next 12 months, 40% modestly. Only 4% said they'd be reducing the workforce. Uh, one interesting thing, though, that I saw in the study was that uh -huh. a lot of folks are sort of taking a wait-and-see approach on a lot of things in their business until they see the outcome of the U.S. election, not necessarily on hiring, but yes. certainly on M&A and some of the more strategic moves that they would be making. M&A, uh, major capital expenditures, 62% yeah. of CEOs reported they would wait until after the election to make those kinds of decisions. And I think it's it's just layering. Is that, is that, but is that different? Because I'm always told that for a lot of folks, elections don't matter. At the end of the day, U.S. policy, while there are changes based on the new president, yeah. Generally speaking, the overarching policies we have are relatively consistent. Is it so opaque right now that people just feel they cannot make those decisions? No, I, th I think what it is is that the two biggest obstacles to yeah. more M&A right now are higher interest rates mm -hmm. uh, being one. And then if you think about the valuations of companies, sh uh, shifting valuations, multiples are very high. Those are huge obstacles. That's what our survey showed. I think that the election just adds one more layer of uncertainty and complexity onto the M&A market, such that everyone's trying to, to figure out, you know, what will it look like after the election, and will it actually present a better environment for actually doing M&A? I, I would say, too, though, Romain, that there are 
there's a lot of cash on corporate balance sheets, a lot of cash at private equity. And it, it's, the market's going to come back. It's just a matter of the duration of this softness. Before we let you go, there was one other thing that we both find interesting. Only a third of CEOs expect people back in the office five days, <laughs> down from nearly two thirds. Man, we've been here five days for a long I time. Like the tiniest life. Yeah. I know. Uh, Really? So, Alex, it's really interesting. We did that same survey a few months ago, late in 2023, and 62% of CEOs at the time said that employee, employees would be back in the office five days a week over the next five years. And it dropped, as you said, to 34%. A remarkable finding. I think what that means is that hybrid is here, here to stay. And you know, hybrid can be anything from one to four days a week, theoretically. And I think we're all getting more comfortable with the productivity of our workforce. And we're not Op, we're not at optimal when it comes to the hybrid environments, but it's an environment they're all more comfortable with moving forward. All right, Paul. Well, this is a, a really illuminating. Uh, Broadcasting survey. from home. That's yeah. what we'll do. <laughs> <laughs> no, bite your tongue. Paul Knopp, <laughs> Chair and CEO of KPMG U.S. A closer look here at CEO sentiment for the year ahead as we continue to count you down to the closing bells and a look at some of the big movers out there on the back of analyst recommendations and a conversation with one of those analysts over at Moffitt Nathanson and his take on DoorDash. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's get a view from the sell side with our top calls, the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations, and we start with Nike. Bank of America lifting its recommendation to buy from neutral with the analyst saying estimates are bottoming and, quote, finally look achievable. We haven't heard that in a while. She also cites upcoming catalysts, including the Olympics and Nike's analyst day this fall. The share is up 4%. Next in line, let's take a look at Airbnb. Two dueling reports out today. Getting cut to hold from buy over at Needham. Part of the downgrade is valuation based, but the analyst also cites challenges with growth on a global scale and believes the market is just a little bit too bullish right now on Airbnb's use of AI. Meanwhile, analysts over at Benchmark, they beg to differ. They're starting coverage of the company with a buy rating and a price target of 190. The firm saying Airbnb still remains the go-to among consumers, hosts, and experts despite increased awareness of alternative platforms. Airbnb shares getting a nice bid today, up 3.5%. And let's take a look at DoorDash, also in on the rally today with an upgrade to buy from neutral over at Moffitt Nathanson. The analyst there, Michael Morton, believes the delivery service can capture growing consumer demand, especially for grocery delivery and those risks from student loan repayments. Morton says they failed to materialize. He's raising that price target to 164. Those shares moving higher on the day by about 2.5%. And those are some of our top calls. Now, we do want to say with that last call on DoorDash, because pleased to say that the analyst behind that call joining us right now in Studio 2. Mike Morton is Senior Research Analyst over at Moffitt Nathanson. And Mike, uh, DoorDash, I mean, there have been a lot of investors who are kind of like pushing this stock to the side here. Um, what gives you the confidence here that we could actually see not just a resurgence in the price, but more importantly, in their growth story? Thanks, Romaine. What we are really interested about with the DoorDash opportunity is it's an exceptionally managed company that's addressing two of the largest markets you can really think about when it comes to consumer behavior. It's restaurant spend, which is a trillion dollar opportunity. That's roughly 8% penetrated by food delivery uh, at the moment. And grocery, which we like to refer to as consumables. This is a $2 trillion opportunity. Is the issue though with DoorDash, I mean, and by, the, by that I mean the issues that some investors have taken with this company, is it one of revenue growth or is it also about their costs, the idea of what they're having to pay uh, their drivers, what they're having to pay uh, for their own sort of internal costs, is that still an issue? Yes, it's historically, uh, many of the companies in my coverage world were more focused on growth and profitability. Mm -hmm. You're seeing the companies find a balance in the middle here. For a company that, like DoorDash that is addressing such a large market, three trillion all in between restaurants and grocery, and they're growing bookings at you know, roughly 20%, you want to think longer term, right? And you, if you manage this business for profitability on a one-year basis, you could really be cutting yourself short of the absolute profit dollars long term. So it's a delicate balance. For as long as they're growing at this pace and, and getting additional penetration into the markets, I think investors give them the benefit of the doubt. So it's really about volume. Yes. So like your, your call is about volume growth. And I know you say, you know, don't bet against the U.S. consumer. But I got to say, man, like I, 
if I'm paying 70 bucks for Chinese food for three people, I'm going to go walk and pick it up and I'm not paying DoorDash because I don't want to spend the money. Yeah, it's that's where we got ourselves in trouble. Uh, we downgraded this stock in the fall. For we, that reason. We'd been a big mm -hmm. believer for a long for a long time of their opportunity and we thought the student loans rolling up uh, rolling in in October were going to be a, a headwind for discretionary spending and it turns out uh, American consumers will continue to pay for convenience. Mm. And despite yeah. that it's a price premium, we've estimated anywhere, roughly 50% if you go and pick it up. People just keep doing it. Uh, frequency is growing, uh, growth is accelerating. It's volume and profitability. The profitability estimates for this company have dramatically improved over the last year by over 100%. Who are the competitors now to DoorDash and how do they, and how do they stack up? Yeah, it's really become a healthy duopoly in the United States between Uber, Uber Eats specifically, and DoorDash. Uh, DoorDash has done an incredible job. Pre-COVID, they sat like roughly a third of the market share. We think at this year, they're going to be roughly 60% of the delivery market with Uber the other third. Uh, Grubhub has been a massive donator of share for the last five years, mm -hmm. uh, and you're just seeing a continuation of that going forward. There's been a lot of, of speculation about even further consolidation in this industry. Is DoorDash at all an M&A play? Yeah, Bloomberg's done some great interviews actually with the founder yeah. on it. Um, and it's something that uh, they bought Walt uh, years ago. It's a European operation uh, and actually rest of world operation. Uh, investors would like to see them focus on the, the, the projects they have, what they have now. on their hands at this time. And mm -hmm. Tony in a Bloomberg interview said our, our hands are full. Mm -hmm. uh, so hopefully they, they keep with what they have. I think that would be the preferred path for our yeah. view and also the investment community. Yeah. And the thing that Alex seems to forget is not everyone manages their money as well as you do, Alex. I mean, so, for some sure. people don't mind blowing seventy dollars <laughs> to get you know a burger and a, you know fries delivered to them. Chinese food, man. I know. It's crazy. Did I tell you about that milkshake that I had the other day? <laughs> no, I didn't. Uh, oh wait, okay, that was on radio. <laughs> Diner Midtown milkshake, nine bucks. Uh, uh, okay, well, I think you got ripped off. And that's no, but, the, but the size is like normal size. And yeah. I was like, if I did DoorDash, though, that would have cost me what, fifteen bucks? <laughs> Where do, what's your favorite place in New York? I was, I was a Han Dynasty person. Oh, uh, 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 favorite place? I don't know. I, I debate. I have a lot of different restaurants. Wherever they sell $9 milkshake. <laughs> $9 it's, not, it's not a $5 milkshake. Yeah. This is like the alternative They don't university. exist anymore. This is my old point. All right, Michael, thanks <laughs> yeah. a lot. Mike Morton over at Mob and Asian. Like, uh, uh, what's there. his name? John Travolta in uh, Pulp Fiction. I, I'm like John Travolta in Pulp Fiction? I am like John oh. I can't imagine anybody <laughs> spending $9 on a milkshake. <laughs> well, I didn't know it until it. I bought it. I was buying it for my dad, and I was like, oh, my gosh. Now, granted, it's Midtown. Maybe that has something to do with it, but I'm just saying. that. Yeah, I think it's the cocoa thing. I think it's the cocoa inflation. All right, coming up. So speaking of prices, we're going to talk about oil. So OPEC says that oil will need to be closely watched to keep a sound and sustainable market. Oil prices are getting a little bit of relief today. We'll talk about that and the relationship with energy stocks with Barrett and partner Arjun Murthy. Uh, this is The Close on Bloomberg. Just about 3.30 p.m. here in New York. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. And one stock I'm watching today, Romaine, is Ford. Now, granted, the stock is up by, well, no, it's kind of flat on the day. But slashing their price of its electric F-150 mm -hmm. a pickup truck by about $5,500. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of inevitable. I mean, the price point for most of these EVs was too high. Now, I understand on a cost basis, the price point was probably too low. But from a consumer basis, it was too high. They got to do something to move this inventory. Uh, it seemed inevitable. Uh, you see Rivian down 7%, yep. per 8% on the day on the back of this because everyone thinks this is going to have a ripple effect through the rest of the EV space. And, of course, we know Tesla, even though they don't want to admit it. I mean, how many times did they cut prices in the last Oh, yeah, yeah. This is yeah. definitely like a... Yeah. Tesla price war thing, even yeah. if they don't want to acknowledge it. Um, yeah. the it's a Chinese, is, a Chinese price war, too. Yes. Yeah. Is it even enough? Like, would you pay mm -hmm. 63 grand for this? Mm, I don't know. Um, you know what might help, though? Four or $5 gasoline, which takes us to oil prices. Yes, they're taking a break today, but analysts seem very divided on if Brent can actually hit 100. So you got rice down energy overnight, seeing the tight market pushing oil to 100 bucks in the summer. Macquarie says that oil isn't sustainable above 90. Well, joining us now with his buy side expertise is Veriton partner Arjun Murthy. Arjun Kern Currently serves as a director on the board of Conoco. Uh, he also worked at Goldman forever and covered the equity side. He's had decades of experience within the oil market. Um, Arjun, it's always good to chat with you. $100 oil, will it happen and when? Uh, it'll happen eventually. Right now, we've been in a range-bound market. I think OPEC deserves some credit. I've historically been an OPEC skeptic, but they've kept us in the $70 to $90 range. I think the most exciting thing going on in oil is that the demand numbers are great. 
you alluded to the issue with EVs and the lead into this. Um, it's not just EV sales sort of fading. Your underlying oil demand growth, I think, is exceeding most people's generally more bearish expectations. And if oil is to sustainably break through 100, it's going to be demand driven. So why do you think that we are at this level? Like, <laughs> I understand that OPEC is managing supply and demand has been really good. But still, it feels like we got here really far, really fast. And I'm just wondering sort of the viability of that kind of move. So after shooting up to 120 after Russia initially invaded Ukraine, we've been in the 70 to $90 per barrel trading band. So it's very reasonable to ask, aren't we kind of just at the high end of the range? And we, we could well be. There's a little bit of OPEC spare capacity that's built up. I think the big drivers that have been fading is we had a lot of surprise on the upside from U.S. shale last year. This year, at least so far, it's still growing a little bit, but we're not getting the big positive surprises. I think the other thing has been there's been this peak oil demand debate. Some people think it's going to peak in the next couple of years. Others think it may be in the 2030s. We've been in the camp that there is not a decade, let alone year, where anyone can definitively say oil demand can peak. And I think what we are most optimistic on is some of these recent demand numbers, especially in the most mature economies like the U.S., Europe uh, and Japan, they're not looking as bad as people feared. And if we don't have peak demand here, we're certainly not going to have it on a global basis when you think about China, India and the developing world. And I think it's that combination of factors. If we are to eventually break through this 70 to 90 dollar band, we're at the high end of it. It's going to be demand driven. And the recognition that shale uh, doesn't come for free and it's not just going to bubble out of the earth forever as it has been for the last decade or so. So, Arjun, how does this sort of feed into, I guess, uh, the corporate story, the earnings story, if you will? I mean, we've all looked at these prices. We're heading into an earnings season where we're going to hear from some of these companies and they're going to obviously have to address this here. Uh, is there a, a, a direct correlation that we can draw to that investors can look to to sort of, uh, I guess, front run this to a certain extent? It's such a great question. I think right now in the big debate will be is what is the time frame by which higher energy prices ultimately feed through to inflation? And when you're range bound, yeah, where prices are up versus recent years. You guys were, were joking about milkshake prices and so forth. We've not seen a sustained rise in oil prices since two decades ago. And I, and I think that is the kind of factor. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. But the debate to me isn't do we go to 100 and then pull back or what have you. But do you go to 100? Do you go to 120? Do you go higher? And do you start staying there? Again, I think it's premature to make that call. We still got to get through some OPEC spare capacity. Right. We're going to have to prove that shale is not going to surprise to the upside. Mm -hmm. But when we look at these demand numbers, I think it's that type of underlying inflation trends that does benefit the energy sector, but it comes at the cost of ultimately higher economy-wide inflation. Again, we're not there yet, right. but I think that is what the worry should be over the long run. So when you look at the rally that we've had, at least to start the year, I think as, at least as a group, I mean, they're up, I don't know, 15, 16% here, uh, not really far off from what we've seen in the broader market here. We start to talk about this rotation, the idea that a lot of investors, they kind of gotten tired of big cap tech, they're looking for other alternatives. Does energy become that? I mean, it's still, I know, a very small portion of the weighting in the S&P 500. But we have seen that come up from, you know, three and a half percent to now four percent here uh, where we stand uh, at the start of April. You know, there's this phrase that software is going to eat the world from, I think, Andreessen Horowitz. And I respect the phrase. And <laughs> it has deservedly gotten a lot of the excitement, a lot of those software companies, great earnings, great returns on capital. But all software ultimately needs hardware. And all hardware ultimately is going to run on energy. And I think that's what the world is waking up to. A lot of our focus at Veriden has been on, hey, we're having this sort of messy, quote, energy transition. There are lots of challenges with it. I actually do think it's going to be big tech. It's, going to, it's a buzzword, and I apologize, but AI, it's going to wake people up to the idea that you, you don't get the software for free. It actually needs energy. And I think it's going to lead people to recognize the sort of ideology between behind energy transition that has caused these challenges, we need to rethink all of this. And there is a pathway towards having a, a diversity of energy sources, including traditional oil and gas, yeah. that I think the world is waking up to, it's going to be needed. And it's, it's kind of what actually gives me the most optimism about where we are in this energy cycle, this recognition that we're gonna need energy and that while software is exciting and tech is exciting, let's not forget what powers all this stuff. Exactly, Arjun, and we were talking about this uh, down in Houston a couple weeks ago when companies have to really rethink what kind of company they need to be, what kind of M&A is that going to trigger? We've seen a lot of consolidation of the big guys with some of the smaller Permian players, or not even smaller, just look at Pioneer. Do we see more of that or do we see a different type of consolidation? 
So, you know, it was a very tough decade for traditional energy last last decade. And I I accept the fact that investors were frustrated and annoyed with these companies and they needed to fix themselves. And a lot of the actions, max dividends, max stock buybacks and some of the M&A we've seen have been trying to address the problems of last decade. And I think they've, that's happened now. The sector is sort of, quote, fixed. The profitability is better. The balance sheets are better. Going forward, we're now looking for who can actually profitably grow? When you say grow as an energy analyst, people say run for the hills. Hmm. That's what they did last decade. So we will emphasize the profitability aspect of it. But what are the new business opportunities? We know shale has been massive, but what comes after shale? Is it international? Is it Canada? Um, is it some combination between gas and power? We know power is going to be a huge issue, yeah. especially with a growing amount of intermittency, questions on reliability, questions on how you feed these data centers. Is there an opportunity for natural gas companies to think differently about it? So when we look at go forward M&A, yeah. when we look at go forward investments, how can these companies, how can this industry be more forward looking and not just trying to fix yesterday's problems? All right, Arjun, great stuff. We have to leave it there. Arjun Murthy is Veridin partner. A closer look here at what's been happening in the oil and energy space. And when we come back after the break, a closer look at what's been going on in the world of finance. We learned just a little bit a while ago about a federal probe into Morgan Stanley's wealth arm. That sent the shares down as much as 7%. It's our stock of the hour. An explanation coming up next here on The Close on Bloomberg. season is coming. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. It all starts Friday on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. All right, welcome back. It's time now for our stock of the hour. A closer look at Morgan Stanley. The shares at one point sinking about 7% on the day in just a span of about 40 minutes. This on the back of some headlines out of the Wall Street Journal about a probe into the company's wealth management business. Shanali Bassett joining us right now with some more details here. Uh, what exactly did the journal report, Shanali? There are a few things. There are multiple regulatory bodies taking a look into this. According to the journal, the SEC, the OCC, and the divisions of the Treasury Department are all taking a look at Morgan Stanley's wealth manager and the vetting of certain clients. So this goes to the idea that the SEC has sent letters, according to the journal, that has listed certain clients and asking about the background of those clients with potential ties uh, to very sensitive businesses, for example, in Russia, or even, for example, uh, uh, an individual who claims that she was based in the U.S. but um, had potentially been sanctioned by the U.K. So the background of U.S.-based clients, as we know, Morgan Stanley is a U.S.-based asset manager and wealth manager, but unlike a lot of the other rivals that they have in wealth management, their business is U.S. wealth management primarily. And so their clients in the U.S. with potentially um, behaviors abroad that had led yeah. to certain legal violations. So this is a really ignorant question. How big a deal is this? Well, it depends on how far this goes, right? If they were to face significant enforcement actions, and again, that we don't know how far along these regulators are in this process, but if they were to face enforcement actions, how deep does that go? How costly could that be? Yeah. It's interesting because a wealth manager, remember, there are a lot of questions about it in particular when it pertains to growth, and it's not just the potential of any potential fines that could come with legal actions, but any potential reputational damage that could come with any wealth management issues. And we have to put this in context, too, and we should just point out, too, we have reached out to uh, Morgan Stanley for comment, and so far uh, they have uh, not actually given us a statement yet. So there's still a lot that we have to sort of figure out what's going on. But also we should point out they got an earnings date coming up next yeah. week. They got a new CEO who just took over. Um, what do or what are what is the messaging going to be around this without necessarily knowing Shanali what yeah. the messaging is going to be around this? Well, that's the big question. Yeah. How are they going to address any mm. potential issues, and are are they going to address these particular probes head on, or will they? And, but don't they have to? Because when I first saw the headline, what jumped out at me wasn't Morgan Stanley. It was Morgan Stanley Wealth management. This was the crown jewel for this company for years. This was yeah. James Gorman's baby. 
Exactly, and remember, they really yeah. had a lot of doubts at the beginning, mm -hmm. but then came out swinging and commanding a premium valuation across mm -hmm. all of Wall Street because of this wealth manager. Now, with James Gorman stepping down, really, this is the second quarter that Ted Pick is stepping into, the first full quarter mm -hmm. of him as CEO. He didn't come from the wealth business. He came from investment banking and trading. And so the question is, what does the wealth management look like under him? Mm -hmm. Because he didn't come from there. Yeah. So Morgan Stanley stock, even before this probe was reported about, was down about 2% or so this year, now it's down almost 7% on the heels yeah. of this probe. Which is also proves like succession is hard, <laughs> no matter which way you slice it, even though they did it all the quote unquote right way. Shanali, great work. Thanks very much. You got to go. You got to get some sleep. You have busiest day tomorrow. Uh, Shanali Basic uh, joining us there. Speaking of, quite interesting. I don't know how jazzed I am about JP Morgan, but I am more jazzed about, say, Goldman Sachs. Uh, next week. I'm trying to get jazzed about J.P. Morgan tomorrow. You're jazzed? Well, yeah, J.P. Morgan, we already know. It's going to be the same old, same old. They'll, they'll beat, you know, James It'll Diamond be. will say something interesting, and then the stock will rally, and then it'll sell off two days later because everyone will be concerned about the valuations. Right, exactly. Rinse and repeat. We can fast forward to Tuesday. <laughs> All right, coming up, we're going to count you down to the closing bell. Yana Barton, portfolio manager over at Morgan Stanley Investment Management, uh, will be joining us next as we look to a market rebounding from yesterday. Unbelievable move. This is the close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. With 10 minutes to go, Alex, that big sell-off we had yesterday. Bye. Poof. Basically uh, reclaimed almost all of the losses we had from yesterday. And the Nasdaq 100 is up, yeah. you know, almost 2% at this point. Yeah. Uh, the Russell also yeah. outperforming. I do want to talk about one stock, though, that I love, and that's Fastenal. It basically makes the bolts that put together the things that you buy. So it's a really good read into the final end demand. And their quarter was not great. Their outlook was not great. And that stock is down by over 6%. So I have to wonder, all the optimism, the growth is okay. Okay, ISM manufacturing number is okay. And then you get the number from Fastenal, and it's not okay. This gets to a broader <laughs> question, though, too, about what exactly, what type of economy are we really looking at, right? And the idea that this is an economy that's a lot more layered than maybe what it was in the past. You're going to have pockets like the Fastenals and the, service, the companies that they service do a lot worse than maybe than some of the other companies. I don't know. Does it matter anymore? Shouldn't it, though? It should. Uh, we had a chance to catch up with Dan Greenhouse earlier over at Solus Alternative Asset Management. And we asked him about this, and this was his view on the strength of the economy. I think we, we need to stop saying it's surprise to the upside. The economy is doing well, full yes. stop, yeah. even with rates where they are. Uh, and, and earnings growth is doing more or less fine, yeah. even with yields where they are. This idea that somehow uh, 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 if the Fed only cuts two times this year or only cuts one times right. this year, that that's some uh, c catastrophe for the market, I, I don't think that's borne out, especially by the performance in the first quarter. Everyone and that was Dan Greenhouse, who helped kick us off to the close just about an hour ago. And here to help take us to the bells is Yana Barton, portfolio manager and co-head of specialty solutions at Morgan Stanley Investment uh, Management. And Yana, I mean, I feel like every time we see a data point, an economic data point that shows the resiliency of the economy, everybody looks that gift horse in the mouth and says something's got to be wrong. Is there something really wrong with our economy right now or can we just take it for what it is? I say you take it for what it is. The economy is strong. We got data points over the past week that continue to support that idea. You had non-farm uh, payroll numbers that were really strong, consumer confidence numbers, obviously CPI number yesterday. I think you take it for what it is, and it's not bad news. In fact, I think it continues to demonstrate that the economy is supportive of the fundamentals that have driven the market to the levels that we are at today, which I think is bullish. And it could be. And we start and we head into earnings season. Yana, the official start, if you will, uh, tomorrow morning here. I mean, what are your expectations? I've seen a lot of wide ranging numbers. Some people saying 10 percent or EPS growth for the S&P. Some may be putting that a little bit lower around five and six. Yeah, I think what you're seeing is the expectations for first quarter is about 3% earnings growth, which actually will mark the trough for the earnings as we continue throughout the year. I'm seeing the same numbers that you're seeing, which is the expectation of about 10, 15, which is, you know, what, what, what you just mentioned for the rest of the year. Uh, the expectations are for $243 as we uh, approach the end of the year. But the market is expensive, right? So as we go through the earnings, which are set up, 
uh, low. The bar has been set low. I think there are pockets of opportunities um, and there are pockets of risk that we need to decipher through. I think the uh, leadership that you've seen to date continues to be the most fundamentally strong pocket of the market. I'm talking about consumer discretionary tech uh, and comm services area. Um, on the flip side, you, you do have th risks and the three risks that we are watching um, is obviously concentration, valuation and sentiment. Um, and we can go into those in a, in a little more detail if you'd like. Right. So if you go counter to that, that would support maybe the cyclicals, maybe small caps in terms of sentiment already being so negative, et cetera. But then when you have rates that are higher, right? And I wonder if the higher rates are really going to mess up the rotation that we've all been expecting. Like, is that where the conversation needs to go? I've been asking myself the same question, Alex, because if I look at the beginning of the year and 10-year treasuries that were at about 3.6% or so, and now we're at 4.57 and change, you've had backup in yields um, near 70 basis points, and you've had all the wrong sectors lead, meaning growth, momentum, um, and uh, the leadership that you wouldn't have expected in the face of higher rates. And one can't help but wonder if maybe the baton has been passed from this, um, you know, monetary policy sensitivity to earnings and fundamentals, which is great for active stock pickers. So we're, we're excited to see earnings come through because I think that deciphering and variance between the haves and have nots mm -hmm. will be even, you know, brighter and better for the companies that are executing. All right. So what's the have nots right now? The have-nots are the ones that don't have cash. Um, so ultimately, it comes down to profitability. If you look at Q1 uh, S&P 500 operating profit margins, they're expected to be around 11 percentage points, which is quite healthy and continues to increase. But in the areas such as tech, home services, and consumer, it's near twice that level. On the flip side, some of the cyclical areas of the market and even staples in healthcare, it's significantly below that. In fact, their earnings and revenue News are under pressure. So we continue to favor sort of, you know, a balanced approach, approach which has some of the growthier areas with a little defensive as well with growth. So defensive quality growth. I am curious, as you sort of look deeper into the year, Yana, there's been a lot of discussion about whether we're kind of pulling forward gains or whether there is that sustainable, uh, sustainability, not only in price action, but of course in corporate fundamentals supported by the economy. That's in spite of the concerns about an election, uh, despite some of the concerns about geopolitics. At what point, if at all, do you factor that in? All of those are risks. You know, I always talk to my team and we're always talking about assets and liabilities. On the liability side, as you mentioned, we have significant geopolitical risk that's going on. And I'm not even talking about the election, which brings in a whole host of other risks that are not um, easily, uh, I guess, um, you know, could be easily inputted into the model. But as I mentioned, there are other risks to the market right now. The concentration is a legitimate risk. You've got uh, top 10 securities representing a third of the market cap. Thank goodness they're the, the highest growth and most profitable companies. But nevertheless, nevertheless, it is a significant risk. You have um, a, a price risk, meaning if you look at history on any given year, on average, the S&P 500 has a sort of a cleansing period, uh, which we refer to as drawdown of about 14 percentage points. To date, as you guys started talking about it, we've had two to three percent weakness and then quick recovery. So we haven't had that. Um, and ultimately, sentiment. Everyone is really bullish. You look at AAII survey, mm -hmm. you look at other sentiment surveys, they're very, very bullish. So you just want to pick your spots. And I think that's ultimately what you need to do. And that's what we do in our portfolios, which is take a very diversified approach yeah. and extremely selective. All right, Yana, going to have to leave it there. Yana Barton, Portfolio Manager over at Morgan Stanley Investment Management. But there's about two and a half minutes, Alex, until the close. Stocks holding the gains, about half the S&P in the green, the other half in the red. Unbelievable. Yeah. We just do not want to go down. I mean, we, with 3% total drawdown yeah. so far in the last few weeks, and then yeah. here we are. We're stabilizing we, with good volume. We should point out it is a little bit lopsided here with only about six of the sectors in the green. Financials on the back foot. Stick with us as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market closed starts right now. 
And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele. We're counting you down to the closing bell and here to help take us beyond the bell. It's a global simulcast with Scarlett Fu in the TV studio, Carol Masser and Tim Stenevic on radio as we welcome our audiences across our Bloomberg platforms. And of course, welcome also all of our viewers watching us on YouTube. Carol Masser, a yes. quite a turnaround from what we were talking about just 24 hours ago in this equity market. Almost all of the gains from yesterday erased. It's like what happened, Losses. right, in 24 hours. Yeah. It's pretty remarkable. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the Magnificent Seven are getting back together again because not all of them have been seeing kind of some of the moves to the upside. Apple alone, right, its biggest move up the most in almost a year here 11 months there's a lot of there's some a story by mark uh german about what they're doing uh with some of their computers maybe a reboot uh when it comes to the max but uh nonetheless that stacks up more than four percent today's session it's interesting this happening on a day where we see uh yields uh at least on the long end of the curve continuing to move higher it's something i asked kathy jones over uh at charles schwab about because she is the chief fixed income strategist and she says okay well we still see you know two rate cuts this year um but her, and this is not her base case, but she said that yields on the 10-year could uh, kind of test those, uh, you know, 4.8 percent, 4.85 percent by the end of the year. Not base case, but we could still see rates move higher. We've seen this before, where equity <laughs> investors shrug off whatever's happening with eco data because they say, "Look, the economy is doing well, and corporate earnings are going to deliver. Whether we get first quarter earnings growth of 3.9 percent, um, as one consensus has it, or something much larger, as it usually happens because everyone lowballs it, um, people are counting on earnings, especially from those magnificent seven names, to deliver." and uh, keep pushing prices up. Yeah, and of course, all seven of those names are in the green solidly on the day with Apple up 4% here. Some other big gainers out there include Paramount and Broadcom. The big drags right now coming from names like Fastenal, which Alex was just talking about a little while ago. As we get the closing bells here in New York, the S&P 500, phenomenal day, a phenomenal turnaround from yesterday, up 38 points or about 7 tenths of a percent, recouping most of the losses from yesterday. The Nasdaq Composite, though, recouping all of the losses from yesterday and then some, up 270. 72 points, excuse me, or about 1.7%. The Russell 2000 also higher here on the day, uh, up uh, right now about six, seven tenths of a percent here on the day. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average, Carol, actually sitting this one out, down about three points. We'll just call it unchanged on the day. All right, unchanged on the day. Back to the S&P 500, kind of an even split, 232 names to the upside, guys, 270 to the downside. NASDAQ, though, uh, NASDAQ 100, Scarlett, almost all the names, 75 gaining in today's session, hmm. 25 lower. Yeah, and that's reflected in the sector performances as well. You look at the IMAP and it's a pretty much a split, although there's a big chunk of green and that belongs to Infotech, communication services and consumer discretionary. So it's like the fourth quarter all over again. All the mag seven, all the big tech names are in the green. The laggards here are financials. Uh, that's Morgan Stanley right there and healthcare stocks as well as consumer staples. All right, let's get to some of the individual gainers. Going to go back to Apple, if I may, because that's your number four gainer in both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100. We talked about uh, Mark Gurman uh, out with his story about them uh, overhauling the entire Mac line with a new family of in-house processors designed to highlight AI. So there's that story out there. Apple shares finishing the day up 4.3 percent. Also interesting, I uh, saw this on the Bloomberg, Apple drawing interest from hedge fund investors seeing potential for AI-linked upgrades to its iPhones and as a slump in its shares reduces the stock's valuation premium. This was coming from J.P. Morgan Chase analysts. So uh, some attention certainly on Apple today. Rent the Runway, we were breaking down their earnings. Uh, this is like off the charts, but keep in mind uh, the stock closing at $19 and change, up 161% hmm. in today's session. A record uh, intraday gain. I'm assuming it's going to be a record gain overall, but uh, this is after the company came out. Fourth quarter revenue and adjusted EBITDA topping the average analyst estimate. Again, we broke this down yesterday. Shares had slid nearly 90% in the past through Wednesday's close. Uh, stock did have a pretty decent and high short position. So fair to say, as we said yesterday, maybe some short covering going on. And Paramount Global, just wanted to mention that number one gainer in the S&P 500 day up more than 7%. Skydance slated to meet with Paramount Management to begin due diligence next week. This was coming from CNBC. They did not cite exactly where that information came from. And ad week out saying Paramount Global has hired, um, it looks like a law firm or firm to explore the sale of VidCon, citing an unidentified person. It just feels like there's a lot of stuff going on. This is not a distressed asset, according to the person in the note, but it does feel like things are maybe slowly moving forward to that final deal, uh, maybe between Paramount uh, and certainly Skydance. And we should also, also mention, uh, just I'll add a fourth there on your board with Amazon closing at a record high today. Uh, good. Yeah. yeah. 
great. First high, first record high uh, since going all the way back to 2021 there, I believe. Um, let's talk about some of the decliners here. Uh, Morgan Stanley closing down 5.25%. It did fall as much as 7.2%. This after a report that a group of U.S. regulators are scrutinizing the firm's efforts to prevent potential money laundering by wealthy clients. We're talking about the SEC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, and other Treasury Department offices, digging into whether the company has done enough to investigate the identities of risky clients, the Wall Street Journal wrote, citing uh, unidentified people familiar with the matter. We did already know that the Federal Reserve was looking into these controls last year. And I don't know if you guys saw this. I think it's the most read story now on the Bloomberg Terminal in the last hour. It's about the insurance company Globe Life, uh, GLUS. It's in the S&P 500, by far the worst performer on a percentage basis in the S&P 500, down 53% today, uh, sinking by a record after the second short seller this month called out the company. Um, shares of the company fell, wow, more than 50%, a record drop that took it to the lowest level in years. Uh, the sell-off followed a critical report from Fuzzy Panda Research, which said it had a short position in oh, the company. Yeah. Um, we should say representatives from um, Globe Life did not respond to a request for comment. The company is scheduled to report earnings uh, later this month. And uh, the report comes in the wake of uh, another uh, another individual over at Orso Partners calling out Globe Life as a short idea uh, just it's, last it week. It kind of amazes me that they haven't come out at this. I mean, this has been going on for like two weeks now, 10 days, right? This is, yeah. well, that first report, yeah, the yeah. first the first was called out at the Stone Conference last week, and then yeah. this Fuzzy Panda report came out today. But 53, there was halted several times, too, yeah. for volatility. Uh, and then uh, let's talk CarMax real quick, down 9.2%. The company uh, did uh, fall intraday the most in more than 18 months. Uh, it reported profits that missed Wall Street expectations. High monthly payments uh, potentially scaring off would-be used car buyers. All right, I'll take a look at the bond market here because stuff did not really happen. Uh, you did have a 30-year <laughs> auction that didn't go very well at all, uh, but yields were only up by about four basis points. Now, keep in mind, this is adding on to the big move that we saw yesterday. So all in all, you're looking at, what, 22, 25 basis points over the last couple days. Uh, but you did start to see some buying in the front end, guys. Uh, so clearly there are yields that people are willing to step in and buy. And it looks like 4.94 for the two-year is potentially one of them. All right, guys. I don't know about how you felt when you read this story when uh, you were maybe reading in this morning. But, you know, New York City airports for a long time, not known for being great places. They've been kind of scary places, kind of old and run down. <laughs> Third world country, as our president put it. <laughs> yes, many years ago. Not well said, right? Um, but anyway, maybe not wrong. But having said that, we've come a long way in a few years and a lot of money. Uh, in March, LaGuardia earning the 2023 title for best airport in North America within its weight class, which, as Tim and I were saying, we didn't even know there were weight classes when it comes to airports. <laughs> but this was based on surveys and passenger feedback, um, basically when they looked at departure and arrival surveys and a lot of other things. But we have come a long way. And I don't know, last time you guys yeah. were in an airport, right? Oh, well, we I, have changed a lot. Well, yeah, I mean, LaGuardia was just, that I mean, talk, talk about low. going from worse. Than, yeah, <laughs> they, they couldn't have gone any further down. <laughs> I, I remember I remember one of the last trips we took before the pandemic out of LaGuardia, before they did the renovations. And we were just like, what, what's going on? Well, I, and now it's a dream. It is it's a better dream. than the Bloomberg office. I've been, oh, <laughs> I've been, oh, I would I wouldn't say Slow that. Slow your roll there. I've been at LaGuardia <laughs> in the past where I've been surrounded by uh, buckets because it was raining outside <laughs> yes. and the roof was leaking. It was like it was like a common, they like permanent bucket set up. Um, it's pretty amazing to see. I mean, it, co it comes at a cost, tens of billions of dollars, public-private partnerships that, that made this possible. But I've been saying all day, um, when are they going to do the subways? Because it did work so well. Well, that's a whole so other well. issue, isn't it? You it, can it have is. gleaming airport yeah. terminals, but if you can't really get there, they were going to expand the air train there, but it costs too much money. So right now, they're running shuttles, which means you get to get stuck in Queens traffic. No, and there's no air train, I believe, coming to uh, LaGuardia. No, no, there isn't, because yeah. it's too cost prohibitive. Exactly. No. Can I just enjoy the nice airlines, the airports, for just a little bit? I wish they'd fly more direct uh, New York to California flights out of LaGuardia. They don't do that? They don't, no. No. I think there's only one, um, but they don't have the runway for it. The good thing, though, is, I mean, JFK is starting to step its game up, too. I mean, there's a couple terminals they, they still need to kind of address, <laughs> but I've been in one of, in the newer one they did out. It's actually pretty nice, too. You know what was really nice? Yeah. I went um, the other time, the last couple times I've gone to Houston, Newark, which I never go to because it cost me like $200 to get there from Brooklyn, but it's really nice it and very really nice. efficient. Terminal A, it's really gorgeous, right? How did that happen? And I that, don't know. 
That was Port Authority at work. See, guys, things can happen. That was Port Authority? That was Port Authority wow. you paid for that. We're all just, you know, stunned into silence. Yeah, I am stunned into silence. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, doesn't Port Authority, uh, okay, never mind. Oh, you got to go there. Careful, be careful. <laughs> we got to go, but I just want to do another shout out for today's big take about uh, the uh, ROI on college. Mm. Um, really, really good story. And wish it kind of wish it would have existed. Um, I won't say how Did many years ago. A few years ago, I would have. When you're 17 years old, you're not like looking into this stuff the way you should. But, you know, I know we don't you know. have time to talk about this, but we were talking with the KPMG uh, US CEO yeah. earlier, that CEO survey. He actually said some companies are actually dropping some of their uh, college uh, college degree requirements for some. I don't believe that. I, I think people say that, but in practice, it's very difficult for them to look at two resumes if they're actually even looking at them and say, when you know what, we're not going to go you know with the guy who graduated from college. When, that's when, a good that's point. <laughs> when their kids don't go to college, I'll believe it. It's hard for kids to that's even get point. internships. I mean, they're yeah. so picky. Yeah. So I. I I'm with you, Scarlett, on that. I don't think they're dropping it It's a yet. great talking point, but... Uh. All right, guys. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Our cross-platform radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. Uh, we call it Beyond the Bell. We will see you for the Friday edition. Same time, same place tomorrow. And we continue our coverage right here on Bloomberg Television Earnings Season. It is upon us with the banks kicking things off tomorrow. Everything you need to know before they cross. That's coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic. Quite a turnaround from what we were talking about just 24 hours ago, Scarlett. We had that big sell-off yesterday here. Most of the losses across the board recouped today, particularly for the NASDAQ, which got that and then some. The S&P up 7 tenths of a percent on the day. The NASDAQ up more than 1.5 percent. Even the Russell 2000 getting in on the action. And there you have it, the Magnificent 7. All seven for once. A rare day where all seven moving higher on the day, including a 4 percent gain for Apple. You got the 2 percent there as a group here. Other risk assets also getting a bid here on the day, Scarlett, with Bitcoin back at the 70,000 mark and the VIX taking a slight leg lower. Feels like a little bit of risk on today as we head into earnings season. Let's take a look at some of the day's biggest individual movers. We're going to start with Alpine Immune Sciences, Inc., tickers ALPN. Uh, M&A is front and center right now with the kidney disease drug developer agreeing to be sold to Vertex Pharmaceuticals for almost $5 billion. The per share price was $65 a share in cash, a big, big premium of course, to the last close. CarMax tumbled 9%. At one point, uh, it tumbled the most in one and a half years. And this is after reporting lower than expected profits on what it calls vehicle affordability challenges. Translation, high monthly car payments are keeping potential buyers on the sidelines. They're not ready to commit yet because the financing costs are fairly high. Now, our top story this hour is Morgan Stanley. Shares nosediving on a report that its wealth management arm is in the crosshairs of multiple regulators. According to the Wall Street Journal, SEC and Treasury officials, among others, are investigating how the firm vets its clients, especially those overseas who may be at risk of laundering money through its wealth arm. Why does this matter? Morgan Stanley has steadily built wealth management into its biggest business to help smooth out uneven earnings from investment banking and trading. Remain. Yeah, and of course, that's going to be a big story for them when they are scheduled to report earnings on April 16th. That is Tuesday of next week. But of course, we get the big bank earnings starting tomorrow. That includes J.P. Morgan, BlackRock, Wells Fargo, State Street, Citigroup, and well, throw in Progressive there, an insurance company. And you see where all eyes are going to be starting tomorrow morning. Right now here on The Close, Ian Lapey joining us. He's portfolio manager over at the Cabelli Funds. And Ian, I mean, we talk about this idea of what the banks represent. Obviously, a lot of people look to these banks, meaning investors, not just for their own internal earnings, mm -hmm. but also for a broader read on what's going on in the economy. Right. What are you expecting? I think earnings should be solid. I think there will be some one-time expenses that impact some of them. Um, the FDIC charge, uh, unfortunately, the one that was incurred in the fourth quarter didn't cover everything mm -hmm. relating to the bank failures. So there'll be more this quarter. Citigroup, which I like, has some restructuring charges related to a significant layoffs they did in 4Q. Mm -hmm. But generally, I think credit remains healthy. Uh, the companies are very profitable and, and well capitalized. Mm -hmm. One area that I'll be watching, and I think you've seen this in the market the last couple of days, is the impact of higher interest rates. Yeah. Uh, there, oh, there was real hope uh, all in the fourth quarter that mm -hmm. there would be significant cuts by the Federal Reserve. Yeah. And now as inflation is proving to be more stickier, I think that's called into question yeah. and, and but, caused 
banks to be weak the last couple of days. So it'll be interesting. Uh, let, let's just take a couple of banks uh, and sure. just go through them. And, and let's start with Citigroup, because mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I mean, kind of feel like everybody knows what J.P. Morgan's going to say. But Citigroup has been through a transition. They've yes. made a lot of changes that, at least for right now, investors seem to be relatively pleased with. What do you want to hear out of Jane Frazier and company tomorrow morning? Progress. I, I think, as I said, there will be some one-time expenses. Mm -hmm. I'll be f more focused on things like the credit quality, which currently is quite good. Their non-performing loan ratio is less than 50 basis points. They have a reserve of 18 billion. So I think they're in very good shape. I'll be looking for that to continue. Uh, capital, uh, they're more than 100 basis points above the regulatory minimum. So I'll be looking for that to continue. I'd like to see continued share repurchases. They're, they've been doing a modest amount of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not really focused on the quarterly earnings per share as, the, as I am the underlying strength of the organization. Mm -hmm. And progress towards the ultimate goal, which they've been talking about for a couple of years, which is to get to an 11 to 12 percent return on tangible equity, which would be like 10 to $12 a share mm -hmm. and a stock around 60. So that, that's yeah. what really gets me excited about Citi. And of course, you mentioned things that have been in progress for a number of years. That includes selling a lot of its retail branches in other countries, like yes. in Mexico, for instance. How patient are investors willing to be with how the city moves through this effort? Because it feels like we've been waiting for a while. Yes, and, and patience has been necessary, but they have made great progress. They've either sold or exited 12 significant international retail banks, and that process takes time. They've gotten good prices mm. um, on the vast majority of them. In the case of Mexico, I actually applaud management because it, it appeared that they were not going to get a good price. So instead, they're pursuing an IPO. Yeah. And the outlook for Mexican banks is really strong right now. So as a city shareholder, I'll be looking forward to, to getting shares in the Mexican Banamax operation. I know you don't own, own Morgan Stanley in your portfolio, yes. but the report on how very regulators are looking into how it vets its wealth management mm -hmm. clients, that could be a bigger concern for any bank that has really built out its wealth management business. And that encompasses a number of them because they like the steady earnings that that business mm -hmm. provides. Is this something where we're going to see a lot more costs tied to the wealth management business as they go back and vet everything? Well, the wealth management business over the years has been plagued by um, turmoil related to, to sort of bad practices. Mm. And a lot of banks have paid fines over the years. I think banks are really focused on that by and large. So I don't know really what's happened at, at Morgan Stanley, but um, I, I'm not expecting this to to result in significant problems for other banks, at least ones that I own in my portfolio. I just want to ask you one other quick question. I only got about 30 seconds sure. left. But with some of the uh, sort of asset managers, if you will, I mean, we, I mean, Citigroup is its own thing. JP Morgan is its own thing. Morgan Stanley, its own thing. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the state streets of the world, mm -hmm. I thought they were benefiting from all the volatility in the market. Mm -hmm. They were benefiting from these swings here. Is that going to show up in earnings for companies like that? I think for State Street, um, I see them really as an asset manager and a custodian as opposed to a bank. They have, you know, minimal credit risk yeah. associated with their business. And they have about $42 trillion under custody, $4 trillion under management. And I think for them, it's a capital return story over the long term. They've yeah. repurchased 30% of their shares yeah. over the last 10 years, including more than 13% last year. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking for that to continue yeah. because the stock is really cheap at 10 times earnings. Yeah. And... Um, buying back shares is the best thing for yeah. shareholders right now. Ian, really appreciate your joining us. Ian Lapey of Gabelli. He manages the Gabelli Global Financial Services Fund. And we'll be continuing the conversation here and speaking with the CFO of Wells Fargo tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern time. In the meantime, we're going to turn now to the regional banks and commercial banking risk, especially when it comes to commercial real estate. Our conversation with Lou Horn. He's president of CBRE Greater Los Angeles. That's coming up next on The Close. Earnings season is coming. I think we're all asking the same question. Just how much earnings growth they're expecting. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Gilead is coming out right now. We have take two numbers. Shares of Pinterest. Lucid Group coming out with its earnings. All eyes right now on NVIDIA. A lot still to come. With the smartest insights. How much bigger could profit and revenue have been? Better than what the street was expecting. Bang in line with estimates. We will have full and instant analysis. It all starts Friday on Bloomberg. Context changes everything.
All right, California became the epicenter of last year's regional banking crisis, and now the state finds itself at the forefront of another trouble spot, commercial real estate. Almost a third of its 127 registered banks have property debt above the 300% level. That's the most among any U.S. states, according to the latest Bloomberg analysis. Joining us right now to talk a little bit more about the market, both the troubles and the potential opportunities, is Lewis Horn. He's the president of CBRE for Greater Los Angeles, Orange County, and the Inland Empire. I'm pleased to say he joins us today in beautiful New York City. Let's face it, we got our own troubles here, but let's focus on <laughs> California you. for a second here. There's been a lot of hand-wringing, I'm sure you know, about what exactly is going on in the commercial property market. We've seen the numbers in terms of vacancies. We've seen the number in terms of loan levels and what's out there here. How much of that is, I guess, fear and maybe just sort of distortion, and how much of that is real? Well, first of all, you have, you've got to break it down into the four subgroups. Mm -hmm. You've got office, industrial, retail, and multifamily. Uh, COVID was the great accelerator, and it really happened made a lot of things happen very, very quickly. So the biggest sector that's been impacted now post-COVID is the return to work issue and the change in the interest rate. Mm -hmm. For office, uh, the retail sector is actually back, hospitality is back, multifamily has, has been impacted slightly by the, uh, the interest rates and there may be some trouble a little ahead on that in the near future. But the primary issue has been in the, in the office sector. Mm -hmm. What about the other sectors? I mean, we talk about office and we know that's kind of its own thing, but we've heard that there are other parts of the commercial real estate space that are still holding up. Absolutely. Well, the interest rates impacted, obviously, the capital market mm -hmm. activity. But I think we, what we saw in the first quarter this year, uh, when I think the perception of the marketplace was that there was stability in the interest rates, um, we saw it actually um, improvements in cap rates for industrial and also for retail. Mm -hmm. um, even in the, in, but what we're for seeing retail as for well, retail, really? okay. yeah, that's yeah. right. Uh, but what we're finding now is that uh, that that with with all the news over the, over the last couple of days, uh, investors want to see certainty and so or at least know that there's some stability relative to interest rate mm -hmm. uh, movement. So when we're seeing today uh, the chances of interest rate hikes, there's going to be a little bit of a pause, I think, in some areas. Okay, a little bit of a pause in some areas. I'm curious about what kind of transaction volume you've seen uh, in the different parts of commercial real estate, given that interest rates are expected to fall at some point. We, the, the date just keeps getting pushed out. Well, first, again, you've got to break it down. We represent the occupiers of real estate. We also represent uh, the investment community. Mm -hmm. Now, you have to, even on the investment community, you need to break that down to the private sector and also the institutional. And let's just talk about office, because I think office is really the most impacted sector post-COVID. Um, and it, primarily, it's because of the combination of the interest rate change and also the return to work issue. The, the, the transactional activity on leasing depends on where you sit in that spectrum. In class A and A plus properties across the country, in, in, in the main urbans, it's very, very active. We're seeing rental increases. In fact, vacancies dropping. But in the overall sector, we're definitely seeing a softness there because there is this uncertainty around the return to work, not only from the occupier, but also concerns around the lending industry and the banks. Right now, to get uh, to, on, a, on the institutional level, on, on properties that are you know, north of, north of uh, 750,000 square feet, half a million square feet, mm -hmm. very difficult if you're in that B or C sector, sector to get any kind of a, any kind of a loan. Compare and contrast the outlook for um, office buildings in downtown LA or downtown San Francisco versus the suburbs where people seem to prefer staying because they don't want to be near a potential crime. They want to be closer to home. You know, they've, they've just gotten accustomed from the pandemic to being, you know, in this walkable part of town. Sure. Well, let's break that down into two because you, meant, you mentioned walkable and that's really important now. We have to, we're going to be going through a redefinition, much like retail has over the last several years, where it used to be a retail comp was a retail, just a, there would be a generalization around retail. Mm. But now there's, there's high street retail, there's box retail, there's um, closed in shop, uh, uh, shopping malls, there's open air uh, lifestyle centers. I think we're going to see the same thing happening in office. For office, it was always A office, B office, and C office. I think you're going to start to see a lot more divisions of, of interest there. To your point, on suburban markets right now, they have been more active. But let's break that into two, because if we're looking at uh, right now trades in that private client area, we're seeing, a, we're seeing users now stepping up and acquiring, because they acquiring office buildings, and that's probably been users, um, the, also the, uh, the uh, universities, mm -hmm. and a lot of municipalities have been stepping up and buying some of the troubled assets in that B-class space in the suburban and urban market areas. 
On the urban market areas where the deals are larger, I think we're going to see, we're, we're definitely seeing some trades, but they're more distressed trades. Uh, where we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, seller financing yeah. and a lot of private equity coming in from family businesses, from you know yeah. a lot of foreign capital, a lot of Asia. Uh, we're seeing definitely uh, Korean capital, Chinese capital, yeah. and some private equity. All right, Lou, this is a great conversation, and we got to catch up again. Next time we're in L.A., we're going to look you up. Lewis Horn there, he's president of CBRE, Greater L.A. and Orange County. A closer look right now at the commercial real estate market. When we come back, we're going to go to space on this day in history. And look back, Scarlett, the big milestone for SpaceX. And here's a question as we go to break. How many launches has SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket made since its debut? Ooh, double digit. I'd say 50. This is Bloomberg. All right, welcome back. It was on this day, April 11th, 2019, when Elon Musk's SpaceX launched the first paid mission for its Falcon Heavy program. That massive rocket, it took off at about 6.35 p.m. local time from NASA's Kennedy Space Station in Florida, carrying a satellite for Saudi Arabia's Arabsat. More impressively, though, was SpaceX then recovered all three of the rocket's boosters, with two simultaneously returning to land and the third on a drone ship in the Atlantic Ocean. It was a feat that Falcon Heavy had failed to pull off before, particularly a year earlier during a demonstration flight that turned into a spectacle with that test payload that included that cherry red Tesla Roadster with the mannequin in the front seat. We got a good laugh out of that, but ultimately SpaceX had the last laugh. It's been launching commercial missions prior to that, but it was with a smaller rocket, the Falcon 9. The addition of Falcon Heavy was supposed to give SpaceX the ability to bid on bigger payloads. But the Falcon Heavy has actually only flown infrequently since its debut, failing to live up to its highest of commercial promise. And that brings us to our question of the day. How many launches has SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket made since it debuted in 2019? Just nine. Nine launches, 17 landings, 14 total reflights if we want to be specific. But by comparison, the Falcon 9 has made 320 launches. Now that has less to do with the poor performance of the Falcon Heavy itself and more to do with improvements to the lighter Falcon 9, which at the time could only carry around 29,000 pounds of a payload. But those improvements would allow that rocket to take on bigger jobs of up to 50,000 pounds. That's key. Because while the Falcon Heavy could still lift more than three times that, more than 140,000 pounds to be specific, its nose cone was still the same size as the Falcon 9 and that really limited the satellites it could carry. As a result, Potential customers really found more utility in the Falcon 9 rocket, which proved to be more nimble, and its reusable boosters, for that matter, had a quicker refurbishment and turnaround time. That was a plus for SpaceX. Now, in addition, many of the more ambitious uses touted for Falcon Heavy, such as flying passengers to deep space, that's now reserved for SpaceX's larger interplanetary rocket called Starship. And the other missions for low Earth orbits, that goes to Falcon 9, effectively leaving Falcon Heavy in that weird middle ground that no one really needs. Still, there are some experts out there that say it might too, be too early to write off the Falcon Heavy altogether. It still takes years for satellite manufacturers to develop new spacecraft, so it is possible that more vehicles will come online soon that are specifically going to need Falcon Heavy's abilities. Either way, the holistic success of the SpaceX programs combined show that the future of commercial space travel has actually found its footing. All right, well, let it stick with space and turn now to companies that are finding ways to explore beyond Earth's atmosphere. Space Perspective hopes to expand its presence as a climate-friendly space tourism company. It's testing out its Neptune capsule to take customers on a six-hour round-trip journey to the edge of space as soon as 2025. Tickets are already sold out for the next few years. I'm pleased to stay here with us in studio. With more is Jane Pointer. She is CEO and co-founder of Space Perspective. Jane, so good to see you. Hello there. Hi. So tell us a little bit about the spacecraft that you've got planned. It's not going to be taken up. Uh, it's not taking people up using the Falcon Heavy, is it? But is it going to be a rocket ship ride or something more like a, I guess, a hot air balloon? So we don't use rockets. We use a space balloon, uh, which is actually the size of a small football stadium at full size when it's up in space. And it's carrying a capsule for eight customers and a captain very gently. It goes to space at 12 miles an hour. Oh. What's really useful about that for our customers is that it makes it incredibly accessible because the journey is really gentle and it takes on these initial suborbital flights it takes us two hours to get up there two hours at the top and two hours down and if you can get on an airplane 
you can get on Spaceship Neptune. So as a business, this means it really throws open the doors so on the market. So you don't have to do as much preparation as You don't do any of the preparation. Yeah. You don't have high Gs. You don't need a suit. Mm -hmm. None of that. You don't actually have microgravity, which for some people is a little disorienting. So we don't have any of that. Instead, we have this super comfortable capsule with a space lounge inside <laughs> that has a bar and a loo and Wi-Fi, you know, all the comforts that mm -hmm. you would want to have when you're going up to have wi -Fi. this. Wi-Fi. Of course. Who are people texting while they're up there? Shouldn't they just be they're looking at the... They're sending pictures to everyone. The, the so that's funny because actually we've been talking about maybe we should actually accidentally turn the Wi-Fi off for a little bit in the middle uh, so people are forced to look at the Earth with their eyes. Yeah. Because every astronaut that has ever been to space, anyone who's ever been to space, comes back and talks about this experience yeah. as something profound. Like it truly is profound for them. And so that's why we're taking people to space. Have you had test runs yet? Yeah, so we've done flights. Actually, we've flown a capsule uh, heavier than our capsule to mm -hmm. space. Uh, we actually have flown a human higher mm -hmm. uh, than we're flying uh, this. So we broke the Red Bull Stratos jump earlier uh, a few years ago, uh, if you remember that. Uh, and so then we're about to get into uncrewed flights with the actual capsule uh, that we'll be taking people in uh, later this year, um, we're anticipating. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to give you a date on that, but watch this space. You'll be hearing about it sometime soon. Well, I mean, when we talk about the product, you sold a lot of tickets for this. There's yeah. obviously a lot of interest in it. But I mean, what is kind of the total market? I mean, this is still obviously a trip for, for wealthy people right now. Do we get to a point, do you see in the near future, where mm -hmm. the prices come down and maybe it's a little bit more accessible to uh, just the average show, maybe? Yeah, so it's super interesting, right? So right now we are at that early adopter phase of the market, mm -hmm. right? So our customers, we're seeing we sold over 1,750 tickets already. Mm -hmm. and, and our customers are, at the moment, people that have dreamt all their lives of going to space, never mm -hmm. thought it was something they were going to be able to do in their lifetime, or you know, they want to be the first to do something. Mm -hmm. You know, we've also, we price it to be right in that luxury travel market, to go to market. Yeah. Uh, what's so the that really, what's the ticket price? $125,000, right? Which so, isn't that bad. It's funny, we were talking on this isn't program. That bad. Well, well, we were talking on this program a couple weeks ago about the Four Seasons is launching a new cruise ship, and we were talking about the prices on those were uh, in the high, way of high five figures, and that was just to stay on Earth. Right. Now, yeah. now think, if you think yeah. in historically about aviation. Yeah. So the first commercial flights were over 100 years ago, a mm -hmm. handful of people going on them, mostly wealthy people, mm -hmm. and now we can't live without it. And so we are at that stage in this industry where mm -hmm. you're just at that inflection point where you're going to start seeing a lot of people going. And of course, with that, ticket right. prices do come down. Well, what about safety? Because you mentioned the early days of flight. Yeah. Let's, I mean, we have, I mean, we were missing that point out, the early days of flight. There were a lot of accidents involved. It was a process here. Yeah, well, at that point, so, though, remember, there wasn't really the experience that there yeah. is today, and there wasn't the regulatory environment that there is today. Okay. So, so Fair we're enough. regulated. Yeah. We're regulated by the FAA. We have enormous amounts of experience. So this balloon, what's super interesting is that most people probably haven't ever heard of a space balloon or this no. kind of balloon that we're, we're using, right? It's actually been flown thousands of times by NASA, by the European Space Agency, our team. Members of our team have flown it many times, mostly for research. Uh -huh. uh, and so it's a very well understood technology. There hasn't been an incident in the last 20 years. So even the technology itself is super safe. And then, of course, with the whole procedures and the policies and the way we do work in human spaceflight, which I've been in my entire career, there's a whole way of doing redundancy to make it incredibly safe. Like there's parachutes, right? Even though this balloon itself mm -hmm. is incredibly were safe, you, you, you have to have a backup. And for us, the backup is parachute and there's four of them, and only one of them needs to work. Do you have to wear a spacesuit? No, that's the beauty of it. We could be sitting here like this. We could actually do this from up there. We could that, do a show from up there. That's uh, why you need the Wi-Fi for yeah, the, well, I'm right? Sure, I'm sure we'll get that approved. <laughs> 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 uh, the cost might uh, be a little prohibited. Did, did I read correctly? Were you in the Biosphere too? I was. I was on the design team, and I lived inside Biosphere 2 for two years and 20 minutes. And that is actually... Two years and 20 minutes. Love yeah. Uh, that is actually what got me on this journey to take yeah. us all to space. Because yeah. that, that's what I want to do. I want to take as many people as possible to yeah. space. All right. Really appreciate your joining us today. Jane Pointer, CEO and co-founder of Space Perspective with, uh, of course, their high-tech space balloon. $125,000 for a ticket to go to space. It's about six hours total round trip.
All right, let's go now to our top three. Every day at this time, we take a deep dive into the folks at the center of the day's big stories. And first up is O.J. Simpson. He has died. The football star and actor acquitted on double murder charges had prostate cancer. He was 76 years old. Simpson's family broke the news on his ex account. The 1994 murders of Simpson's ex-wife and her friend permanently tarnished his legacy. Simpson served a nine-year prison sentence for kidnapping and armed robbery in an unrelated case following his murder acquittal. All right. Um, I'm keeping an eye uh, on uh, somebody different. We're going to pivot from that. Uh, ben Milkman, uh, maybe not quite the household name, obviously, as, as some of the other folks here, but making a big move here. The hedge fund manager going to Bridgewater Associates, the biggest uh, hedge fund firm out there. And what I thought was interesting, too, is we've seen quite a few changes now going oh, on yeah. in this space here. A lot of people poaching other folks. And you're seeing, you know, companies like Bridgewater, I mean, they can cut checks that some of the other places can't cut. And so you're seeing a lot of rotation right now for talent here. Uh, so uh, good for Ben here. He's uh, obviously going to be worked to death, that's for sure, given what we know about Bridgewater. But they're really trying to reshape that firm, firm under Nir Bardea. And uh, I think it looks like ben, Ben's going to be a big part of it. Yeah, it's a completely yeah. different firm from what it was a few yeah. years ago when Ray Dalio was still heading yeah. up everything. Did you read The Fund, by the way? Yeah, yeah, very interesting Look, Very I know, interesting and I hope, book. I hope Ben read it as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the first thing you need to do, right? All right. The third person I'm watching is Brandy Chastain. The U.S. soccer legend and Olympic gold medalist spoke with Alex Rodriguez and Bloomberg's Jason Kelly on the latest episode of The Deal. Take a listen. And I honestly believe that part of the equation that wasn't in our control was the mass general public and the business sector not ready for women. Yeah. Not ready for powerful women, not ready for women with big voices who have grand ideas. We didn't have the deep pockets. And, and before coming here today, I think that's the one thing that kept coming into my head was I had zero dollars that I could be an owner with. Of course, women's sports is definitely having a big, big moment right now with Caitlin Clark, with the franchise values of NWSL teams. And in fact, uh, Brandi Chastain is a co-owner of the Bay Football Club, which was an expansion team in the National Women's Soccer League. Um, Cheryl, uh, Cheryl Sandberg, another one of the uh, owners as well. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I mean, you can check out the full episode of The Deal uh, with Jason Kelly and Alex Rodriguez. That airs tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on Bloomberg Originals. Or if you can't catch it then, you can tune in at 7 p.m right here on Bloomberg TV. All right, let's take a look at how markets closed on day because I don't know if you remember, but a few days ago I was saying the CPI report could come in hotter and stocks would still rally. I was, you know, kind of right in that I was, a, you know, off by one day, but investors pretty much looking past the inflation numbers and fixating remain on the earnings prospects. And we have earnings uh, kicking earnings off tomorrow. Is, look, earnings is where it's at. And everyone we've spoken to has basically said, look, all the obsession we have over the Fed and mm -hmm. rates and stuff, yeah, it matters. But sure. what's going to matter much more are what these companies report over the next a few weeks here. And more importantly, the guidance, not really just the backward yes. looking 1Q numbers. But that guidance going forward. And I have to tell you, I mean, I, I love always, I like the fact we kick off with the banks. Because usually we get some pretty interesting commentary about macro conditions, particularly out of Jamie Dimon over at JP Morgan. Fortress Morgan. Balance Street. Uh, is it, yeah, yeah, we'll see how much of a fortress it is, but it's also like, you know, he, he doesn't shy away from talking about his competitors, yes. talking about uh, other areas and fintech and like that. So I think we'll learn a lot tomorrow. Hopefully yeah, we'll absolutely. Tomorrow. We'll find yeah. out to what extent consumers are paying their credit card debt uh, bills and yeah. um, how much they're really relying on other ways to kind of make ends meet. So that sets the tone for the rest of earnings season. And then by the time you get to the retail earnings, it's kind of like, oh, done deal. We, we kind of knew that given what the banks were telling us. Um, also, I just want to mention gold prices continue rising. It's like unstoppable. Unstoppable. Yeah, that's right. Okay continue to go up here and that be, uh, sets up the price action as we head into tomorrow here in a big earnings day. Stick with us. A lot more coming up here on The Close on Bloomberg. For our Muni moment, have you heard of Oakland University? Its stellar performance in the NCAA men's basketball tournament raised the school's profile. It's also helping the school tap the bond market. The Michigan Public College will be offering $18.5 million in municipal bonds in the coming days. Joining us now with more is Oakland University's Vice President for Finance and Administration, Stephen Mackey. Stephen, good to speak with you. 
Oh, thank you for having me. It's an honor. So congratulations on how well the school did in the NCAA tournament. My question to you is, was the plan to always sell bonds this spring? And did how much of the team's performance in March Madness uh, determine the timing? Actually, it was just pure luck with regards to the timing. Um, the, bond, the bond, you know, it comes up on maturity at, at a, you know, at various times. And uh, today, it just came up at, during this time. So we've been planning this um, long in advance of the uh, tournament run that we had. And so, um, but having it line up with the tournament has just been absolutely fantastic for us. We've gotten a lot of uh, recognition, not mm -hmm. only within the state, but nationally. And so it's been um, absolutely fantastic and, and, and really is building a lot of uh, buzz around not just the, the, the basketball program, but also the university. Yeah, that's a good point. And in fact, in the bond offering, uh, the documents, I understand that you mentioned the upset win over Kentucky as well. Is that something that um, gets brought up quite a bit when you talk to potential investors uh, about the debt sale? Do, do people bring that up? You know, it's funny. You can't have a conversation anywhere right now without people bringing that up. It, it, I did not realize when I was at the game how um, how big of a moment that was in college sports and how big of a moment it was for our university. And we have really capitalized on it, not only with um, you know the excitement and everything else, but also with people knowing who we are. If you take a look at our financials, we're very strong, and um, we we really we really are uh, we really are. Um, not only uh, a sports powerhouse right now, but we're also financially very, very strong, especially for our sector. So you've got this attention here, uh, Stephen. And of course, I mean, there are a lot of people, of course, when they heard Oakland University, most of us had to you know, look it up and they go, oh, it's not in California. But anyway, it gets to a broader question here about how visibility really can drive investment demand for these types of issues here. Is there anything comparable you've ever seen, not necessarily just in your own uh, in your own uh, tenure there at Oakland, but uh, it just in the overall muni business at all? I have not seen this before. Um, I think it's a very unique opportunity. And in the, and, and part of it is the age of social media and um, the, the ability for us to get our brand out very quickly um, through our student athletes. And then, um, you know, as you know, our, our website or you may not know, our website crashed for about 15 minutes um, right <laughs> after when we just had an enormous influx. And um, we've seen a big influx in our student um, applications and uh, interest in our university as a whole as a result, which also helps us with our bond offerings because it, it, puts, it puts our revenue projections into a better light. So how do you sort of, I guess, capitalize on this longer term? I mean, you've got this issue coming out here, but you think you can kind of take the momentum that you've gotten coming out of the tournament and sort of, uh, I don't know, are we going to be talking about this in Oakland University two, three, ten years from now? Well, you know, that's the plan. You know, again, you talk about um, fortuitous uh, moments. We also have a new basketball practice facility coming online in December of this this year. And um, with Coach Campy having all this uh, attention with, um, so we're looking very good in the, in the, uh, in the exchange. I can't remember the name of the, I just drew a blank. I apologize. No, That's no, okay. go ahead. Yeah, just, just with the, uh, with the portal, um, our portal interest has gone up exponentially. Um, our, our nil interest has gone up quite a bit as well. So we have a lot of momentum behind us. We have this new basketball Pro, uh, facility coming up. We've got the longest standing coach in the in the NCAA Division One, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got this big win behind us. And and uh, so you know everything looks good. You know when you when you pivot and you take a look at our financials, you know we've had positive cash flow through yeah. a pretty significant downturn in our budget. Um, we did do we had the fiscal di discipline to cut the budgets when we needed to. Mm -hmm. um, our balance sheet has increased during that time as well. And so we're in a really good position um, financially, and our outlook is looking much more stable, yeah. um, as you saw within the uh, within the Moody's rating. All right, so you've got to leave it there. Uh, great to talk to you, and uh, really uh, just congratulations on the success, both on the court and on your balance sheet, uh, apparently. <laughs> uh, Stephen Mackey over there at Oakland University, the VP of Finance. Uh, we do have some breaking news crossing the wire right now involving the oil industry and involving ConocoPhillips and involving the U.S. White House. The Biden administration now said to plan to effectively stop any Arctic oil drilling, at least on about half of Alaska's North Slope here. 23 million of acres of Alaska's North Slope serving as an emergency oil supply. And we're now learning that President Joe Biden, as soon as tomorrow, uh, plans to finalize 
new rules that would effectively bar any drilling on about half of that land. Based on Bloomberg reporting, we are learning that this won't affect the big project that ConocoPhillips has out there, though it will affect the other half of that. We'll get you some more details and bring it to you as soon as we can. This is Bloomberg. All right, as we wrap things up on the big show today, we push ahead to some of the big things tomorrow, and there's going to be a big one for U.S. Steel. Shareholders are preparing to vote on that acquisition by Nippon Steel. This comes as the U.S. Justice Department has opened that extended antitrust investigation. Joe Doe, Bloomberg uh, Metals and Mining editor, joining us right now. And Joe... It's kind of a foregone conclusion, right? I yeah. mean, they're going to vote for this tomorrow? Yeah. I mean, I yeah. was talking to a source earlier today who said they're expecting maybe even 99% approval from the shareholders on this mm -hmm. deal. It's a great deal. It's $55 a share. That's a premium. I was saying the other day to some somebody, about $10 above per share what people were expecting before the deal actually was announced. Yeah. So it's, it's great for the shareholders. There's very little reason for anybody to vote against it. But, 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 regulators, CFIUS, yeah. there's a lot of uh, reason to oppose the deal that's from right. the government's perspective. That's exactly right. And that's the holdup, right, is that CFIUS is looking at this on national security grounds. Mm -hmm. It's a black box. We don't know what they're thinking or what they're going to say. But obviously, that has been in the minds of the investors, that this deal wouldn't go through because ultimately, Sifius knocks it down and because of the politics around it. The president came out, said he doesn't support this deal. Right. He wants it to be American owned and operated. And that has had the investors worried now but, for but a But is month. there an alternative? I mean, it's yeah. easy for the president to say that. And I understand his concerns right. here. But we're talking about industry. You know this better than anybody, Joe. Right. I mean, they need this. You're, yeah, you're talking yeah. about uh, down the line, we could get into litigation. Yeah. We'll leave that off to the side for now. The options are you kill the deal and then somebody else comes in. It could be yeah. one company. It could be multiple companies. And then it could just end up being U.S. Steel going back to its normal self. Uh, Cleveland Cliss has been very vocal that they would go and make another offer for the company on their own. But remember, they have massive antitrust concerns that were laid out in the proxy that everybody knows about. So the DOJ would not obviously be approving yeah. of a Cliff deal if they just bought the whole thing in one go. All right, Joe Doe covers this for us here at Bloomberg. That vote uh, on the big deal uh, is uh, scheduled to happen uh, tomorrow. We have, will have full coverage uh, of that when it crosses. Meanwhile, quite a few other things going on tomorrow as we set you up uh, for what to watch, Scarlett. And that includes another central bank decision. Yeah, the Bank of Korea will be holding its interest rate decision. They're likely to keep rates unchanged at 3.5%, so no change there. And back here in the U.S., we do get those big bank earnings mm -hmm. kicking off. J.P. Morgan City among some of the uh, more notable. Wells Fargo as well. And of course, that kicks things off for earnings season, as we were talking about earlier. It really sets the tone in terms of setting expectations for what uh, companies will tell us overall about demand, about uh, the, the, the conditions yeah. out there, the credit conditions. We are going to get some economic data tomorrow, that first preliminary reading of uh, University of Michigan consumer sentiment. And we get to hear from a lot of Fed members. Do we need to hear from them, Scarlett? We're going to get it one way or another. Oh, so gosh. a lot of Do Fed we have speak to listen, tomorrow. Though? <laughs> <laughs> the markets will listen, and then they'll, you know, in the case of the equity market, move on to earnings. Yeah. All right. Well, one of those. You're going to uh, hear from uh, Susan Collins, I believe, at around 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And, of course, that U.S. Steel shareholder vote tomorrow as well. Thank you for watching us here on The Close. We'll be back tomorrow with full coverage. Meantime, stick around. Balance of Power coming up next at the top of the hour right here on Bloomberg.